And uh, we are joined now by Professor Ntlantla Maike from the National Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences. A very good evening to you. Thank you so much for speaking to us. So for those who are uninitiated, can you tell us about the importance of the works of Dr. Mapala and uh, what his contribution was, uh, as we mentioned, to the literary sphere here in South Africa? Dr. Mapala's work make him come conspicuous in the pantheon of Bantu language literatures. And having written more than 40 books, and spent more than 45 years of his life writing, means that he was dedicated to writing in the language. And his work spanned the crop genre, he wrote novels, poetry, and short stories. Mm. And that made him significant in the history of physical literature. Most of his books were prescribed in schools, and does that not mean that that is the main criterion for judging the works of writer? But the fact that he decided to write in pursuit when he might have or could have written in English makes that important. It demonstrates that he was committed to the language. And the heritage that is left for us, I think, in terms of numbers, there is no writer writer who was as prolific as he was. And just in terms of his underlying mission, the ethos uh, be behind producing his works, can you share that with us? Uh, you see, we must be conscious of the fact that because Mapala was writing in his suit, it does not necessarily mean that his ethos was only grounded in the sutra, and that the themes that he dealt with were parochial. No, that is not so. He rolled on a wide range of themes that encompassed the human condition. But in his poetry, he also celebrated the sutra language and culture, and tried to anchor its position in the mainstream of modern South Africa. Mm. His uh, stories, the novels and short stories, span across a wide range of milieu and environments that are both urban and rural, that are modern and postmodern. So that is very, very important in that he did not circumscribe the language to those issues that might have thought, might have thought to have influenced or affected only to sort of speaking peoples. No, that is not true. And one of the younger writers who produced a biography of Tadema Mapala, Pule Lechisa, has written broadly about him and exactly about his life. And he mentions somewhere that it would not be an exaggeration to regard Tadema Mapala as a state of social literature. That is how important he is. If I could ask you to please share with us some of those themes, some of his best works, and how he used different media to spread the word, to uh, promote his work. Uh, let me just start by saying that when a writer writes, the writer is not necessarily writing in order to promote his work. He's writing because of something that inspires him. There's a message perhaps that he wants to share with the community of readers. There's perhaps some ideas that he wants to share with people who might be interested in them. There are some thoughts. Those may be ideological, they may be philosophical, they may be cultural, but he wants to share with the people. And from that perspective, one does not write in order to promote a certain idea, but one writes in order to encourage, in order to nurture discourse in talking about the themes and problems that we deal with in this era. In terms of the novelty, that is conflicts that one finds amongst community amongst communities in terms of groupings. It dealt with issues of conflicts in a uh, working place, it dealt with issues of conflicts in uh, in schools and education. He did such a broad range of themes that one cannot compartmentalize them and summarize them in a particular theme, just as one would not 
compartmentalized Shakespeare theme broad, broadly across the board in terms of content, the, hu the, hum uh, the human nature, the human condition. And that is the problem. And in my lecture, what I did is that I looked at aphorisms that I drew from Bantu wisdom law. Taking it from Mapala, who used a lot of this in his writings. Now, some people take aphorisms, proverbs, and idioms, and, uh, and so forth, and even folk narratives, that these are relics of the past. And when we talk about them, we sometimes keep on hoping that these were meant to teach children about life, about behavior, about ethos, about culture. That is not true. We have to interpret them in the way that are relevant today. We've got to interpret them and analyze them in the way that will be current and prospective. And that is what I did in my lecture. I, did a, I, I took a few uh, sort of proverbs that transformatively and what I call transfiguratively translate into helping us look at the challenge of society. Okay. I gave a 10 examples. One of them is one, uh, which literally translates that a traveler or a guest is anything that is catered for, even a state. Now, people will circumscribe that to a particular interpretation. But if one looks at that broadly, it tells us about the conflicts that exist especially in present day South Africa. It talks about problems of migration, forced or voluntary migration. If one migrates, arrives in a country that holds him or her. You arrive, you learn the ethos, the culture, the language, the worldview, the paradigms, the mindset of the people among whom you settle and you accommodate yourself in terms of their worldview and then perhaps you can bring in your own worldview in order to enrich that community that has accommodated you. But the first thing is you eat, eat consume what is being catered. Do not arrive and demand that I am so and so and I come from the west or the east and I demand that I be treated according to my traditions. That is what that proverb teaches us. It also teaches us that consuming or taking in or, absorb, or internalizing other cultures is not how the other does. It actually enriches you. All right. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Uh, speaking about Dr. Mapala's uh, works there, uh, that is uh, Thank you very much for your time. I wish we did have more time to discuss some of these issues.